Hello, buddy. Welcome back to the Tin Man Score channel. I'm your host, Jeffrey Tin Man Taylor, and today I'll be reading Chapter 10 of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde for you. This is Part 2. Now, I was looking through the pages, and I was like, I might have to end up doing a Part 3, but this is the final chapter of this book, so without further ado, let's get started, shall we? I must hear speak by theory alone saying not that which I know, but that which I suppose to be most probable. The evil side of my nature to which I had now transferred the stamping efficiency was less robust and less developed than the good which I had just disposed again in the course of my life, which had been, after all, nine-tenths a life of effort, virtue, and control. It had been much less exercised and much less exhausted. And hence, as I think it came about that Edward Hyde was so much smaller, slighter, and younger than Henry Jekyll, even as good shown upon the consciousness of the one Evil was written broadly and plainly on the face of the other evil besides which I must still believe to be the lethal side of man. Had left on that body an imprint of deformity and decay. And yet, when I looked upon that ugly idol in the glass, I was conscious of no repugnance, rather of a leap of welcome. This too was myself. It seemed natural and human. In my eyes, it bore a livery image of the spirit. It seemed more expressed and single than the imperfect and divided conscious I had been hither to accustomed to call mine. And in so far, I was doubtless right. I have observed that when I wore the semblance of Edward High, none could come near to me at first without a visible misgiving of the flesh. This, as I take it, was because all human beings, as we met them, are commingled out of good and evil. And Edward Hyde, alone, alone in the ranks of mankind, was pure evil. Hey, I say he is pure evil. He kills people for no reason. <laughs> I lingered but a moment at the mirror. The second and conclusive experiment had yet to be attempted and yet remained to be seen. If I had lost my identity beyond redemption and must flee before daylight from a house that was no longer mine and hurrying back to my cabinet, I once more prepared and drank the cup, once more suffered the pangs of dissolution and came to myself once more with the character, the stature, and the face of Henry Jekyll. The night I had come to the fatal crossroads had I approached my discovery in a more noble spirit. Had I risked the experiment while under the empire of a generous or pious aspirations, all must have been otherwise, and from these agonies of death and birth I had come forth an angel instead of a fiend. The drug had no discriminating action. It was neither diabolical nor divine. It but shook the doors of the prison house of my disposition, and like the captives of Philippi, that which stood within ran forth. At that time, my virtue slumbered, my evil kept awake by ambition, was alert, and swift to seize the occasion 
and the thing that was projected was Edward Hyde. Hence, although I had now two characters as well as two appearances, one was wholly evil and the other was still the old Henry Jekyll, that incongruous compound of whose reformation and improvement I had already learned to despair. The movement was thus wholly towards the worse. Even at that time, I had not yet conquered my aversion to the dryness of a life of study. I would still be merely disposed at times, and as my pleasures were, to say the least, undignified, and as I was not only well known and highly considered, but grown towards the elderly man, this incoherence of my life was daily growing more unwelcome. It was on this side that my new power tempted me until I fell into slavery. I had but to drink the cup to doff at once the body of the noted professor. And there's uh, Henry Jekyll drinking the potion. And to assume like a thick cloak that of Edward Hyde, I smiled at the notion it seemed to me at the time to be humorous. And I made my preparations with the most studious care. I took and furnished the houses in Soho to which Hyde was tracked by the police and engaged as housekeeper, a creature whom I well knew to be silent and unscrupulous. On the other side, I announced to my servants that a Mr. Hyde whom I described was to have full liberty and power about my house in the square and to parry mishaps. I even called and made myself a familiar object in my second character. I next drew up that will to which you so much objected, so that if anything fell me in that in the person of Dr. Jekyll, I could enter on that of Edward Hyde without procuring loss, and thus fortify as a suppose on every side, I began to profit by the strange immunities of my position. Men have before hired bravos to transact their crimes, while their own person and reputation sat under shelter. I was the first that ever did so for his pleasures. I was the first that could thus plot in the public eye with a load of general respectability. And in a moment like a schoolboy, strip of these leanings and spring headlong into the sea of liberty. But for me, in my in penetrable manner. The safety was complete. Think of it. I did not even exist. Let me but escape into my laboratory door. Give me but a second or two to mix and swallow the draught that I had always standing ready. And whatever he had done, Edward Hyde would pass away like the stain of breath upon a mirror. And there in his stead, quietly, at home, trimming the midnight lamp in his study. A man who could afford to laugh at suspicion would be Henry Jekyll. The pleasures which I made haste to seek in my disguise, whereas I have said undignified, I would scarce use a harder term, but in the hands of Edward Hyde, they soon began to turn towards the monstrous. When I would come back from these excursions, I would often plunge into a kind of wonder at my vigorous depravity. 
this familiarity that I call out of my own soul and sent forth alone to do his good pleasure was a being inherently malignant and villainous. His every act and though centered on self-drinking pleasure with a steel evity from any degree of torture to another. Relentless like a man of stone, Henry Jekyll stood at times aghast before the acts of Edward Hyde, but the situation was apart from ordinary laws and insidious relaxed the grasp of conscience. It was Hyde, after all, and Hyde alone. That was guilty. Jekyll was no worse. He woke again to his good quality seemingly unimpaired, he would even make haste. Where it was possible to undo the evil done by Hyde, and thus his conscience slumbered into the details of the effeminacy of which I thus convinced, for even now I can scarce grant that I committed it. I have no design of entering, I mean, but to point out the warnings and the succession steps with which my chastisement approached. I met with one accident which, as it brought on no conscience, I shall no more than mention an act of cruelty to a child aroused against me the anger of a passerby whom I recognized the other day in the person of your kinsman. The doctor and the child's family joined him. There were moments when I feared for my life, and at last, in order to pacify their too just resentment, Edward Hyde had to bring them to the door and pay them in a check drawn in the name of Henry Jekyll. But this danger was easily eliminated from the future. By opening an account at another bank in the name of Edward Hyde himself, and when by sloping my own hand backward, I had supplied my double with a signature, I thought I sat beyond the reach of fate. Some two months before the murder of Sir Danvers, I had been out for one of my adventures, had returned at the late hour and woke the next day in bed with some what odd sensations. It was in vain I looked about me. In vain I saw the decent furniture and tall proper proportions of my room in the, in the square. In vain that I recognized the pattern of the bed curtains and the design of the mahogany frame. Something still kept insisting that I was not where I was, that I had not wakened where I seemed to be, but in the little room in Soho where I was accustomed to sleep in the body of Edward Hyde. I smiled to myself and, in my psychological way, began lazily to inquire into the elements of this illusion. Occasionally, even as I did so, dropping back into a comfortable morning doze. I was still so engaged when, in one of my more wakeful moments, my eyes fell upon my hand, now the hand of Henry Jekyll. As you have often remarked, was a professional in shape and size. It was large, firm, white, and comely. But the hand which I now saw clearly enough in the yellow light of a mid-London morning, lying half shut on the bed, clothes was lean, corded, knuckly of a dusty, a dusky parlor, and thickly shad with a swarthy growth of hair. It was the hand of Edward Hyde. I must have stared upon it for near half a minute, sunk as I was in the mere stupidity of wonder. He, for terror, woke up in my breast as sudden and sternly as the crash of symbols and bounding from my bed 
I rushed to the mirror and the sight that met my eyes, my blood was changed into something exquisitely thin and icy. Yes, I had gone to bed Henry Jekyll and I had awakened Edward Hyde. How was this to be explained? I asked myself and then with another bound of terror, how was it to be remedied? It was well on in the morning. The servants were up. All my drugs were in the cabinet. See right there. He woken up to Edward Hyde in the mirror, not him. So he should have figured out how to cure this affliction before it got worse, you know. A long journey down two pair of stairs through the back passage across the open court and through the Tomical Theater from where I was then standing horror struck. It might indeed be possible to cover my face, but of what use was that when I was unable to conceal the alteration in my stature? And then with an overpowering sweetness of relief, it came back upon my mind that the servants were already used to the coming and going of my second self. I had soon dressed as well as I was able and clothes of my own size had soon passed through the house where Bradshaw stared and drew back at seeing Mr. Hyde in such an hour and in such a strange array. And 10 minutes later, Dr. Jekyll had returned to his own shape and was sitting down with a darkened brow to make a faint of breakfasting. Small indeed was my appetite. This explicable incident, this reversal of my previous experience seemed like the Babylonian finger on the wall to be spelling out the letters of my judgment. And I began to reflect more seriously than ever before on the issues and possibilities of my double existence. That part of me which I had the power of projecting had lately been much exercised and nourished. It had seemed to me of late as thought the body of Edward Hyde had grown in stature as thought when I wore that form. I were conscious of a more generous tide of blood and I began to spy a danger that if this were much prolonged, the balance of my nature might be permanent overthrown. The power of voluntary change be fortified and the character of Edward Hyde become invigorably mine. The power of the drug had not been always equally displayed. Once very early in my career it had totally failed me. Since then I had been obliged on more than one occasion to double and once with infinite risk of death to trouble the amount in these rare uncertainties had cast hitherto to the sole shadow of my uh, contentment. Now, however, and in the light of that morning's accident, I was led to remark that whereas in the beginning, the difficulty had been to throw out the body of Jekyll it had of late gradually but decently transferred itself to the other side. All things therefore seemed to point to this, that I was slowly losing hold of my original and better self and becoming slowly and corrupted with my second and worse. Between these two, I now felt I had to choose. My two natures had memory in common, but all other faculties were most unequally shared between that them. Jekyll, who was composite, now with the most sensitive apparatus, now with a greedy gusto, projected and shared in the pleasures and adventures of Hyde, 
but Hyde was indifferent to Jekyll. Or, but remember him as the mountain bandit remembers the cavern in which he conceals himself from pursuit. Jekyll had more than a father's interest. Hyde had more than a son's indifference. To cast in my lot with Jekyll was to die to those appetites which I had long secretly indulged and had to late begun to pamper. To cast in it with Hyde was to die to a thousand interests and aspirations and to become at a blow and forever despise and a friendless. The bargain might appear unequal, but there was still another consideration in the scales for while Jekyll would suffer smartly in the fires of absence, Hyde would be not even conscious of all that he had lost. Strange as my circumstances were, the terms of this debate are as old and commonplace as man. Much the same inducements and alarms cast to die for any tempered and trembling sinner. And it fell out with me as it falls with so fast and majority of my fellows. That I choose the better part and was found wanting in the strength to keep to it. Yes, I preferred the elderly and discontent doctor surrounded by friends and cherishing honest hopes and bay a resolute farewell to the liberty, the comparative youth, the light step leaping impulses and secret pleasures that I had enjoyed in the disguise of Hyde. I made this choice perhaps with some unconscious reservation, for I neither gave up the house in Soho nor destroyed the clothes of Edward Hyde, which still lay ready in my cabinet. For two months, however, I was true to my determination. For two months, I led a life of such severity as I had never before attained to and enjoyed the co compensations of an approved conscience. But time began at last to liberate the freshness of my alarm. The praises of conscience began to grow into a thing, of course. I began to be tortured with throes and longings as of high struggling after freedom. And at last, in an hour of moral weakness, I once again compounded and swallowed the transform and dropped. I think I'm going to stop it and um, go to a part three because I still got like four more pages left, but it's going to take forever. So that's going to be it for now. Don't forget to like, subscribe, turn on post notifications for more uh, book reading content like this. This has been another successful installment of the 10 Man's Corner Channel. I'm your host, Jeffrey 10 Man Taylor. I said that's a wrap and have a nice day.